A giraffe would not be a giraffe without its long neck, and neither would a neuron be effective in our brains without its structure of connections to other cells. This leaf bug would not blend in very well if it were not shaped like a leaf, and this protein would not walk inside the cell if it weren't shaped like feet. So we know that throughout living things, structure is important. So also with the informational molecule of our life, DNA. But that's easy, we all know, probably even non-scientists know, DNA has a double helix structure. That's done, all we need to think about is the sequence. That's gonna answer our real questions, like how two Rachel McCords can actually have different research interests. <laughs> Um, so indeed, we've sequenced the whole human genome, and it's amazing what we can learn, but it leaves us with many mysteries. Like, out of all the DNA, only a tiny bit codes for proteins. And even though I am theoretically more complex than a worm, I have the same number of genes, and so do all of you. How does this, how does this DNA possibly make us so complex when such a little bit of it is genes? A bigger question that I have is if the nucleus inside our cell was the size of a tennis ball, and we stretched out the amount of DNA that has to fit inside of it, it would stretch nine miles, all the way from here to my house in West Hills. And I would challenge any of you to package that much inside of a, such a small space. It's almost as hard as packing a whole research program into a Pecha Kucha talk. <laughs> so this is the main question that my lab likes to study. How does all the DNA fold in three dimensions and fit inside our cell? And how can the cell keep this information organized and actually use it when I can't even keep the uh, earbuds in my pocket organized? They always come out tangled. And yet, the cell manages to replicate its DNA and divide it, and it doesn't get tangled. We can look at the DNA, and we can see beautiful pictures of nuclei and DNA in different ways. But here, we have no idea where different genes are in these pictures. So in my lab, we use a technique where we can actually link the sequence of genes to what their interactions are in the three-dimensional space. We use chromosome conformation capture, where you can basically think of this as a ball of yarn. We've heard spaghetti, I use yarn. Um, and we want to find out which pieces of yarn are touching each other. So we can sprinkle glue all over it, cut the yarn into pieces, pull them out, and now the pieces that are still stuck together are the ones that were interacting originally. We do this in cells, and the beauty of DNA sequencing is that we can actually identify every color of yarn by its sequence. We can figure out where all the interactions in the genome came from. And we used to call this 3C, then 4C, then 5C, then 6C. Now we just said, forget it, let's call it high C for the entire genome, not a juice box. Um, and so what we can actually do is now, as we find all the interactions, we plot them in this matrix. So every time we see an interacting piece of uh, one piece of DNA with another, we add it to our matrix. And as we develop millions and millions of sequence reads, we see a pattern which looks like the end zone of the University of Tennessee. Um, I hope that this will be a uh, prettier uh, picture going forward next fall. Um, and now, as, as we look at the structure, we can see that as we zoom in more and more, we see that plaid pattern, but then as we keep zooming in, we see more and more levels of structure. Like if you zoom into Google Maps and you see cities and then towns and then streets and neighborhoods, it's kind of like the genome structure is a set of nested Russian dolls. The more you zoom in, the more detail you get. And so what we find is that the way that all this DNA is packaged into the nucleus is as loops of loops of loops. It's a fractal, the same as my favorite vegetable, the fractal broccoli. Um, which is made of pyramids of pyramids of pyramids, or this beautiful picture that spirals of spirals of spirals. We see this throughout nature, and it's also true of the genome structure. Well, is this anything besides cool? In fact, it's actually essential for how our cells are different from one another. All our cells have the same DNA sequence, and yet they fold in different patterns, as shown by these red and blue high C maps at the top, and that helps tell the cell which genes to turn on, which genes to turn off uh, at different times. We can actually zoom in, like I showed you before, and find out how these genes are turned on. That little spot that you see there represents an interaction between a certain gene and another piece of DNA. What we might have called junk DNA uh, when the genome was first sequenced actually is responsible for looping around and turning on that gene in the right place in the right time. We can find that that enhancer, we call it, knows not to turn on gene one because there's actually a boundary in the structure. There's a big bunch of white there where there's no interactions across that. And these boundaries and this complex regulation is part of what makes us more complex than worms. And in fact, if people have a mutation that removes just that little tiny bit of a boundary, which again, would have been considered junk DNA, it was totally unexplained why this mattered, um, that actually misregulates all these other genes at the wrong places and the wrong times, and people can get dramatic problems like too many fingers, fuse toes, sex reversal, and if this happens as you're alive and your DNA gets damaged, this can cause cancer by misregulation of genes. 
So now that we understand the importance of this structure, we can start to have a new window into devastating diseases like this hutchinson guilford progeria syndrome, where children are born looking normal but age extremely fast and end up dying in their teens looking like elderly people because their nucleus, which should be round like the top, is all wrinkly like the bottom. We can now look at the effect of that wrinkling nucleus on the chromosome structure that we know is so important. So we took cells from a father who's healthy and a progeria patient child, and we were amazed that our first high C heat maps came back looking almost the same. But then as we let the cells grow in our plastic culture dishes just a little bit longer, two more rounds of division, we found that this structure falls apart. And so obviously this is not good. And what we are now trying to understand is how does this happen um, is as we can zoom in to more and more detail and why is this having an aging effect on these children. And now that we can see that this nucleus shape change has such an impact on chromosomes, we're also interested in when cancer cells have to change their nucleus. Did you know that for a cancer cell to metastasize, the biggest challenge it faces is to squeeze its nucleus across tight spaces into the bloodstream or lymph, lymph system. Sometimes the nucleus can even explode, and that blue scary face over there is the DNA leaking out. Um, but the cells that survive that process become metastases. So we want to look at how does the genome have to change in its 3D structure to allow that to happen, and how could we possibly stop it from happening by changing the chromosome structure. And so whether we're looking at aging or cancer or just gene regulation that we all, uh, we all need, the 3D genome is providing us a new window into looking at all of these problems, and we're excited to see where we can go from here. Thank you.